Oh boy. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> now I've got to watch my P's and Q's. <laughs> oh, I can edit anything. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. Can you follow me around all day long and edit <laughs> what I say that I should have thought more about before it slipped out of my mouth? We have a couple okay. of folks from, from Michigan. Oh, Wisconsin is what we're looking for, though. Wisconsin and Florida and Indiana yeah. and New Jersey. My goodness. Um, a math yeah. student in South Africa, Chandra. Wow. Someone's in South Africa? If there's a door prize, we've got Boca Raton. Oh, wow. Honolulu. My oh, wow. Goodness. Oh, that's where I want to go. Aloha. Aloha is yeah. great. Oh, I also exciting. see Jill from Minneapolis, Minnesota, my home state of Minnesota. Welcome, Jill. Oh my goodness. Yes. What time is it in South Africa? That's a great question. Is it the next? It's they're eight hours or nine hours ahead of us. Okay. So it's morning, early morning. Metro Atlanta. Jana, I'm in Athens, Georgia. So I'm um, I'm your neighbor. All right, it's seven o'clock. Right, it's time to go. It yeah, is, time it's to start. Six o'clock here, Central Time. I want to welcome everyone for being here tonight and taking time out of your busy lives. Um, it's just a pleasure to have uh, Jan and Carrie here again. Uh, they were here in May and did a three-week series for us, and. Um, uh, I am, for me personally, this book is um, a godsend for educators that are making that shift or trying to understand what the science is about. And when Jan and Carrie um, wrote this book and I, I had to reach out to them because that's who we are. That's our science of reading page. And um, they have done a wonderful job in in sharing how to make that shift. And it's just really exciting to have them back. So I will take some time to introduce them. And we are asking that you, um, you can put your name in and what your, what your position is. And then we're going to have a survey and then we have a really cool surprise for those in attendance. So let's get started. So Dr. Jan Birkins was an elementary classroom teacher for eight years and began her career in 1989 as a kindergarten teacher in the heyday of whole language. She was frustrated because not enough of her students were learning to read and went to graduate school to learn more about how to help them. Her dissertation was a meta-analysis in the research on phonemic awareness, which was published around the same time as the National Reading Panel meta-analysis. After graduate school, she worked as a literacy coach, a district literacy leader, and a K-12 language arts consultant at a state regional service agency, all, of, all in HS and writers. I'm not sure what that means. Anyway, um, <laughs> Carrie's home state of Georgia is, oh, Carrie's home state is Georgia. You didn't move, right? No, you're- No, oh, that's me. <laughs> Anne's from Georgia, but I'm from Minnesota. I, I kind of wish I was from Georgia in the winter. Okay, so anyway, that's what it says in front of me. And I obviously I didn't proof this. For almost 12 years now, she has been a full-time writer and consultant, mostly oh, supporting still Jan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we're still on Jan. Uh, yeah. supporting literacy educators. She has four sons ranging in ages from 13 to 25 and lives in Athens, Georgia. Four boys. Wow. Okay. Four boys. All right. So Carrie Yates is an educator, author, speaker, and coach with a passion for helping busy literacy educators thrive. Her teaching experiences include time as a classroom teacher, special education teacher, and reading recovery teacher. Carrie has also spent the last 16 years serving as an elementary principal and district level administrator. The connecting thread of all of Carrie's experiences in schools has been a passion for early literacy success, as well as providing effective leadership for change. Carrie's goal is to help other educators discover what's next on the road to helping all students thrive. 
Carrie is the grandmother of four beautiful grandchildren mm -hmm. and lives on a Minnesota lake with her husband, John. So between the two of them, Jan and Carrie have authored and co-authored eight books for balanced literacy educators, including the book that brings us together tonight. So without further ado, our wonderful um, hostesses, <laughs> presenters, <laughs> Jan and Carrie. Thanks, Donna. And we really, truly want to just begin by thanking you and mm -hmm. um, recognizing with everyone in this group how your brave work is really um, shifting things for children across this country. We, we really celebrate you. And um, we also um, celebrate and are a little bit in awe of the fact that um, you reached out to us in the first place, Donna, and um, made this connection. And we're going to share some of our thoughts about bridge building, but we really, we really hold you up as a mentor in the area of bridge building. And we want to start by saluting and celebrating you. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. And we, we want to share with you this session tonight called um, Shifting Balance, Leading for Literacy Change, Wherever You Are. And mm -hmm. I'm Carrie Yates. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm Jan Birkins, and we're going to talk with you tonight about the ways you can leverage um, our book, Shifting the Balance, and or its companion online class to bring more science-aligned literacy instruction into your classroom and make learning to read easier for children, which is what this is all about. Mm -hmm. And so before we get started, started in earnest, we want to find out a little bit more about you and what brings you here tonight. So in the chat box, we'd like you to share um, your name. Maybe you already did that, but you can just put your name again, if you will. And um, which of these statements, one through five, most resonates with you? Basically, we want you to tell us who you are and then, you know, tell us a little bit more about your reasons for participating Mm -hmm. putting that number in the chat. So like I'm new to science of reading, but I'm ready to make critical shifts to my practice. Mm -hmm. Or number two, I'm well into my own science of reading journey, but I'm a fish out of water in my own school or district. Or maybe it's number three, I'm a strong advocate for science of reading. And quite frankly, this book makes me nervous. Mm -hmm. Or number four, I'm a strong advocate for balanced literacy. And quite frankly, this book makes me nervous. <laughs> Or maybe it's number four, I'm tired of polarization and I'm unsure how to bring people together. So if you don't see the number that fits best for you, feel free to make up your own number and your own statement, but we just like to get a feel for who's in the room and what brought you here tonight. Seeing lots of ones and twos. Um, yeah. Some fives. I like this, Chelsea. She's an advocate of balanced literacy, but the book doesn't make her nervous. It makes her excited. Oh, that's great. Beautiful. Thanks. Melissa Graham. Is that? So um, we really appreciate your honesty in this and, um, and your willingness to share that number with us. And Donna, do you want to talk about the the other piece or do you want us to do sure. that? So our wonderful authors have decided to share with you um, three seats to their training and oh wait, let me put my video on. And um, so, but we wanted to make sure that first of all, you want this training. Um, mm -hmm. How many hours is it? It's 20, about 12 hours. hours. Uh, so it's six modules, each is about two hours of video. We have a couple of live um, in-person Q&A and connection events. Um, and then of course, it's whatever amount of time you put into a reflection and reading and connecting with other educators. But mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a six week course um, with three additional weeks. It's asynchronous. Um, so we release new content each week for six weeks but then you also have three additional weeks at the end, if you're like me and might have gotten behind and need a little catch up time. <laughs> um, but yeah, we wanna offer three seats to people who are here tonight who think it might be a good experience for them to, um, to help make the shift wherever you are. So yes. if you're interested in that, um, 
put your name in the chat because I will be trying to pick three winners tonight. Um, Why oh, she's got the magic kind of thing going on behind the scenes. Okay. Right. Right. Um, okay. So, all right. All right. Thank so you. we're going to jump in. Let's jump in, Jan. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever brought you here tonight, we're going to tell you a bit about what you can learn from our book and from our online class, both of which are called Shifting the Balance. Um, and we just told you a bit about, about that course and how it's built. Um, but what I didn't mention is, you know, we really work hard to have fun in that class because we're real believers in adult learning and professional development it needs to be respectful and fun and recognize that, um, you know, adults are doing hard work all the time. So, you know, we do things like play the ukulele and sing some songs and um, have some fun <laughs> with each other along the way as well. We get our families involved a bit and Jan's dog, of course, is sometimes the star of the show. But right. um, what we ultimately want to offer to you is um, by the end of this session, we hope that you're going to have some insight into if one or the other of these resources might be right to support you on your journey or one of the many strategies that we're going to share with you just for making a shift in general um these resources aside so yeah. i didn't uh, mean to rush you i i accidentally yeah. advanced the slide <laughs> it's okay. okay and so we're really excited to share this content with you because it brings with it the really great news that there is a lot that researchers have discovered about how the brain learns to read that we can enact in classrooms. And you know this, that's why you're here, to make our instruction more brain friendly and make learning to read easier for children. Yeah. And making learning easier for children like Jonathan matters to all of us. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, for example, is a second grader who's still struggling with reading even the most basic words. And Jonathan knows he's struggling and his classmates know he's struggling and Jonathan knows his classmates know he's struggling and his parents know he's struggling because they have to work to get him to go to school each day. And his teacher knows he's struggling and she's unsure how to support Jonathan. And children, oh, I'm sorry, Carrie, go ahead. Yeah. And also there are children like Lucia. Lucia is a third grader who came to school knowing all of her letters and sounds. So she got off to a strong start with decoding simple texts in kindergarten and first grade. But as she started to encounter more difficulty or encounter more difficult um, language and um, words in her texts, the language structures and text got more and more complex, um, things started to kind of fall apart for Lucia. All those strange big words and sophisticated ideas have now left Lucia feeling a bit like maybe reading isn't for her after all. Mm -hmm. And you know, the work we sign up for when we become educators is bold and audacious work. And what children like Jonathan and Lucia have taught us time and time again is that teaching is an act of courage. And it's work that brings us face to face with our own vulnerabilities and the need to keep stretching on behalf of children. And so we invite you to pay attention to both your head and your heart in this work. And to support you with that, we're going to share the commitments we made to each other and to this project from the get-go. These are from page seven of our book, and these are what we rely on when we really need to muster our courage. Um, we're going to read them to you now, um, just in case you want to lean on them some too. Mm -hmm. So the first commitment, um, we commit to being kind to ourselves, making peace with the unavoidable reality that there are things we have missed, misunderstood, and misinterpreted. We commit to honestly appraising our current practices with an open heart and an open mind. And we commit to recognizing and reflecting on our own triggers and biases. Yes, there are a few of those. <laughs> we commit to actively working to lower our defenses so we can raise our awareness. And we commit to reconsidering, reprioritizing, 
or simply letting go of less helpful practices in order to make space for some that are more effective. And finally, we commit to taking action rather than giving in to the paralysis of self-doubt and or overwhelm. Hmm. Boy, that's when we got to practice a little bit today, isn't it, Jan? It is. <laughs> okay. If you would like a copy of these six commitments for yourself or for your team, we've got them available on our website in two different formats as free downloads. The first is just a fun little one pager you can post somewhere and refer to it as often as feels right. And the second is these really beautiful colorable bookmarks that were made for us by Kim Hark Reader. And I always like to mention that they print on two pages, they cut apart into six bookmarks that fit perfectly paired with a full-size Hershey bar. <laughs> Chocolate's very important for the adult, adult, adult learning experience. Yeah. So, you know, this sense of vulnerability captured in these commitments that we just shared is pretty much a constant for us as we do this work. And while at the beginning of this project and throughout, we rolled up our sleeves and we took a deep dive into books like these, as well as the stacks of research behind them. Our reading diet has also included a lot of books like these, books written to help human beings navigate change, rethink their long held beliefs, engage in difficult conversations and offer leadership on polarizing issues like the quote unquote reading wars. <laughs> And through all this study, really what we've come to understand is that this change work is as much heart work as it is head work. And to ignore either piece is to make substantive change less likely, is to make the change you're working for less sticky. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, we've developed a resource for you called From Walls to Bridges. And if you're trying to make these shifts, you're going to find where we have a lot of things that we've made for you and they're available for free on our site. And so we're just going to keep sending, you know, mentioning these and sending you there if you want to ac access them. So, but if you're trying to make these shifts yourself, or if you're trying to lead others in making shifts to practice, this tool offers up six walls that we as human beings tend to put up when we want to resist change and six corresponding bridges that we can build or walk across um, to engage with change, even when it's scary. For and example, I'm, I'm going to tease you a little bit because, um, you know, we like to do things in sixes, but actually this tool is five bridges, oh. <laughs> not six. So if you grab the handout, don't feel like you got cheated out of That's one right. set of walls and bridges. It really is only five. It's five. Okay. Yeah. All right. we're, we're gonna, yeah, we're just going to highlight one of these tonight, right? We are. Yeah. Go ahead, Carrie. Let's, and, let's over, over let's. Yeah. I mean, I think we, we often say we, you know, whether it's um, thoughts and ideas or bricks and mortar, we have choices about what we can do, what we can build. And um, so we can build either bridges or walls. And the first bridge that we want to just mention, I'm sorry, the first wall that we want to mention that often can interfere with this work is the wall of overwhelm. Mm -hmm. It is common for educators to look at reading research and feel overwhelmed, especially when it comes to translating that science into practices with the children sitting in our classrooms. Overwhelm shows up as fear, fatigue, paralysis, procrastination, or just plain avoidance. The where to start question is really real. Mm -hmm. But the antidote to overwhelm is finding entry points, just starting somewhere. Mm -hmm. And in every case, whatever the task, whoever we are, we all have to find a place to get going. You Even really if it's imperfect. The noises, please. I'm sorry, Carrie? Even if in some cases, <laughs> um, what might be called for is a more complete and total transformation of practice. And the vast body of evidence about the reading brain will never matter 
if it doesn't find its way into classrooms, one consistent and thoughtful action at a time. And really shifting the balance, the book and the online class is about finding entry points to get, build and sustain momentum. The whole book is built on this question. What is one action I can take today to start momentum toward change? Mm -hmm. And shifting the balance offers entry points in these six areas. Language comprehension, phonemic awareness, phonics, high frequency words, prompting and feedback, and text selection for beginning readers. We refer to these as the six shifts. So the whole book is about getting started, or it's a tool for maybe helping someone else get started. Many of you shared the number that indicated you're pretty comfortable in your own science of reading journey already, but you might find that this is the right starting point for somebody who's less comfortable or far along or as you know what I mean? <laughs> Less far along than you. <laughs> we want to be clear. This book was never meant to be the end all be all the last thing you would read about the science of reading in any of these areas. This book was meant to be a starting point. Mm -hmm. Our primary intent with the book and the online class is to help those who are at the beginning of their journey move into more science aligned literacy instruction especially anyone who might be feeling uncertain or overwhelmed to kind of find this place to put their boat into what can sometimes feel like this rushing river of information. Mm -hmm. And so each chapter in the book and each module in the class opens with a familiar classroom scenario featuring a common practice that turns out to be not as helpful as maybe we once believed it was. And then we move from that scenario to untangling four or five common misunderstandings that might be driving the practices described there. And most of these misunderstandings are remnants of an approach to teaching reading that has been built from the outside looking in, but that actually turn out not to be aligned with what we know about how reading actually works from inside out, from inside the brain, which means that many of these practices are not actually brain friendly. So the misunderstandings in the book help us shift our mental model from an outside in to an inside out approach to teaching reading. And then after clearing up four or five key misunderstandings, we, we provide a succinct bulleted list that kind of summarizes the key science presented in the chapter. And then after building respect for the why behind the shift, we dedicate the second half of each chapter to tools for making the shift. These tools include high leverage instructional routines that are intended to help you identify immediate starting points. And these high leverage starting points are designed to make the lift of transformative change feel accessible mm -hmm. so that you can avoid that overwhelm that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And finally, each chapter of Shifting the Balance ends with a set of questions intended to help you or those you are supporting reflect on current practices and intentionally plan next steps. Those reflection pages are one of my favorite parts of the book. I realized the other day that I, I sometimes forget about, but um, you know, that's such just such a powerful piece is just, you know, we all can read and study and learn our heads off, but it's mm -hmm. ultimately that reflection and deciding how to bring it to practice. Mm -hmm. We follow the same structure, untangling misunderstandings and sharing high leverage routines to use as entry points for each of the six shifts. So now that you have a sense of how the content of each shift is set up within the book and within the class, our remaining time together was going to be divided into two parts. Mm -hmm. First, we're going to give you a high level overview of each of the shifts. And then we're going to share a tool um, giving you examples and tips for leveraging, shifting the balance to make some changes in your school or district. Jan. Yes. We're going to start with the first shift. Oh, yes. You know, I love the first shift. I know you love the first one. 
And we put this one at the beginning on purpose because you're not supposed to have favorite children. <laughs> it's probably not supposed to have favorite shifts. But if I'm going to tell a little secret, this is Jan's probably favorite. my favorite shift. So in chapter one, chapter one is about language comprehension. And we put it at the beginning of the book because we wanted to just right out of the gate communicate that really this is a place where we're all on the same page, regardless of what quote unquote camp you align with. Everybody wants children to read and comprehend what they're reading. And so in this chapter, we unpack four uh, common misunderstandings about reading comprehension, such as this one, which is misunderstanding number two in the chapter, is this misconception that comprehending spoken language and comprehending written language are two different things. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we unpack this misunderstanding along with three others by looking at the mechanisms in the brain that process spoken and written text. And in chapter one, we introduced the three-part language processing system, the four-part processing model, and the simple view of reading. And the takeaway for chapter one in a nutshell is that reading comprehension doesn't actually start with reading. It starts instead with listening comprehension. Reading comprehension actually piggybacks on language comprehension, meaning that without strong language comprehension to hitch a ride on, reading comprehension will plateau in or around late second and third grades, like it has for Lucia, who we mentioned at the start of this session. And once chapter one gives you an understanding of some of the key brain science behind comprehension, we give you seven high leverage routines for bringing that science to life in your classroom. And one of those, for example, is we walk you through how to accelerate language development by repeating and expanding what children say, which is a really powerful but relatively simple practice to implement. And on our website, you'll find this tool related to chapter one. Um, it's there as a download if you want to go ahead and experiment with repeating and expanding. Which really draws on the work of Grover Whitehurst. Absolutely. Sorry, I didn't say that. Yes, Grover Whitehurst. Um, work with dialogic reading is, is what that is. And basically, shift one is about understanding the connections between how the brain processes spoken language and how it processes written language so that you can make learning to read easier for children. Which brings us to shift two, which focuses on phonemic awareness instruction. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Carrie, who maybe this is her favorite. Is this, I, I it, it may be her favorite. We'll see. I, you know me, I, I always have a hard time choosing. I mean, I want it all. I have to have multiple favorites. So, um, but chapter two is, um, shift two is phonemic awareness. And in the book and in the class, we clarify five sources of, com of confusion about phonemic awareness, including misunderstanding three, which is the inaccurate assumption that if children know all of their letters, um, letter names and sounds, they'll be ready to read. And in this chapter, we clarify what phonemic awareness really is and dig into the idea of alphabetic principle, connecting it to how humans invented the alphabetic system in the first place, creating this new work for the phonological processing system. And here in a nutshell, we explain that not knowing letters and sounds is actually not the most common difficulty children have in learning to read. Instead, insufficient phonemic awareness is actually the most common cause of reading difficulties, which has been a significant contributor to Jonathan's struggles along the way. And in chapter two, we recognize that the brain is not wired naturally to hear phonemes in words, which means learning to read requires some intentional rewiring of the brain. We actually have to train our brains in order to um, hear the phonemes inside words, train our brains to temporarily shift our focus from the meaning of words, which it's really wired to pay attention to, just long enough to focus instead on the internal structure of those little each individual spoken sounds within 
words. This isn't easy work for the human brain. And so after exploring the science, we then offer six high leverage routines for explicitly and intentionally helping children um, learn to listen for phonemes within words. And to support you with this work, one of the tools we've developed is a really comprehensive um, phonemic awareness skills development tool, which is on our website. And this will give you um, lots, of, um, lots of levels of phonemic awareness practice, words and um, teacher language, words lists and teacher language to support phonemic awareness practice in your classroom. So basically shift two is about how rewiring brains for reading isn't easy work, it isn't natural work, and it can't be left to chance. But also it's about how you can provide engaging and intentional phonemic awareness instruction from the start to make learning to read easier for the children you serve. And so in the next shift, Jan, are you ready mm -hmm. to dig in a little I bit am. of phonics? I am. So shift three is about your phonics instruction. And um, in shift three, we clarify five misunderstandings that are widespread. And for example, one of them is misunderstanding three in the book, which is that phonics isn't really worth teaching because English is so unpredictable and spellings are so unreliable. And in this chapter, we tackle the idea of deep orthography, we dig deeper into the work of the orthographic processing system, and we make the scientific case for a brain-friendly scope and sequence for phonics instruction. And in a nutshell, we, this chapter um, argues for transparent and thoughtfully designed plans for phonics instruction. And while we do affirm that English definitely does have this deep orthography, um, that depth of orthography doesn't mean we can't or shouldn't teach children how the code works. In fact, this depth makes explicit instruction all the more important. Because as we keep saying, reading is not natural for our brains. And so the goal of effective phonics or sound spelling instruction is that it that it be explicit, it be systematic and cumulative. And we unpack all of these uh, concepts at length in the book and in the class. And this intentional instruction around brain friendly, a, a brain friendly scope and sequence actually sets up a filing system in children's brain so they can easily retrieve the alphabetic information and focus more on comprehending what they are reading. And then after working through all of that science, we offer seven high leverage routines for bringing phonics to life, phonics instruction to life in your classroom. And one of those recommendations is that you use a consistent lesson structure so that children can focus on the new content in each lesson and they don't have to guess where you're going. And we have just such a lesson available as a free download for you at our site. Jen, you know me, I can't ever make a choice. I'm thinking, hmm, I also wanted to choose telling them about, we've got a hundred plus word chains um, ready to go for them on the site as well. And word chains are such a powerful tool for pulling phonemic awareness and phonics together and really strengthening alphabetic principle. So um, I just thought I'd throw that in because you know, I can yeah. never, yeah. You know, we, we got a little carried away. It's almost... <laughs> It's it, there are a lot of tools there for you to to just help yourself to. So, yes, because I thought it's that hard too. work to be a teacher and trying to mm -hmm. invent things for, you know, for yourself. And it's hard to we just we our goal is to make reading easier for children. And we do that by making the lives of teachers easier and more mm -hmm. accessible. Yeah. So, so. basically, um, Making learning to read easier rather than harder for your students um, can involve planning to teach the code in cumulative ways with lots of opportunities for practice. So now we're at chapter four, which is a favorite of lots of people. And so Carrie, high level overview. I mean, I guess I will say chapter four is my favorite. I've oh. decided now that it is. Okay. 
Um, I get really excited about this one. This one is about high frequency word instruction. And in this chapter, we unpack five common misunderstandings, such as the widespread idea that the best way to learn high frequency words is to practice reading, writing, or chanting the letters over and over again. In this chapter, we, um, this chapter, uh, this one and the remaining chapters in the book are really, they really are this point of connecting all of the science understandings that have been built up until this point, including the ideas of meaningful letter strings, four part processing model, alphabetic principle. We also introduce in this chapter the idea of lexical quality and airy stages for word reading, as well as drum roll, the big one, orthographic <laughs> mapping. And the takeaway for shift four in a nutshell is that learning words as whole units, which is a very common practice that we certainly, you know, have engaged in oh, and yes. know lots of teachers have just learned that that's the way to teach words, got to learn them as whole units, that that's really not a brain friendly or sustainable approach. And it is definitely not what proficient readers do even though many of us were taught that children just have to memorize these words. But shift four makes clear the critical relationship between phonemic awareness and phonics for word learning as we demonstrate the need to really leverage the alphabetic principle by scaffolding orthographic mapping, the opportunity to align graphemes and phonemes um, so that the brain can come to understand that all written words are made up of meaningful letter strings, that they are not just random or unexplainable groupings of letters. And that term meaningful letter strings, we tip our hat to David Kilpatrick on that one. In the second half of this chapter, we offer a powerful and simple um, science aligned new routine for the explicit teaching of high frequency words. We also offer some tools to help you revisit and reprioritize the high frequency words that you are choosing to teach explicitly in your setting. And to support this work, we offer a download of 109 power words. You're gonna be excited to learn um, all of the benefits that can come to children when we are thoughtful about which of these words to teach um, explicitly and first. Um, and we've adopted We've adapted this work from the work of Adams, Carol Davies, and Richmond. So chapter four dismantles the idea that word recognition is primarily a site-based activity, replacing it with the understanding that word learning depends on phonology, orthography, and meaning. Which brings us to the high-level overview of our fifth critical area of literacy instruction, which is drum roll prompting and feedback. And in shift five, we unpack four misunderstandings, including misunderstanding number two, which is the idea that children should figure words out by first thinking about what makes sense. And this often involves looking at the pictures instead of connecting the letters on the page to the spoken language they know. And in a nutshell, we tell you more about brain-friendly ways of scaffolding beginning readers at the point of difficulty, ways that actually increase the likelihood that they will read for meaning. And what an understanding of the reading science reveals is that some of the prompting practices we've relied on are brain-friendly, surprise, surprise, and actually make learning to read harder for children, especially in the long run. Um, in a nutshell, the problem is that many of the strategies we've come to rely on actually set up inefficient reading processes and they take children away from decoding work when it's so critical for them to be getting practice and they have them work around the words rather than all the way through them. So for example, saying, look at the picture, what would make sense gets children quickly saying the word cat, but it usually doesn't get them to actually read the word cat or even better, remember the word cat. And as pictures and context become less supportive, 
this strategy falls apart for children, which is what has happened to Jonathan. And what brain scientists want us to understand is that we send kids, if we send kids around the words rather than through them, they might say the correct word in the moment, but they will miss the opportunity to strengthen and expand their orthographic processing systems or build those efficient filing systems, which are so important for fluency and comprehension as texts get more complex. And in the second half of the chapter, we offer seven high leverage routines for bringing the ideas in this chapter to life in your classroom. For example, we offer the look before you leap protocol. And by now you know where to find this free download <laughs> on our site. But this protocol supports the brain friendly use of graphophonemics and of context, including pictures. And the big idea for shift five is that teaching children to go all the way through words rather than go around them is the best route to efficient fluent reading as texts get more complex. Which brings us to the last shift, which really piggybacks on shift five. And Carrie is going to bring it home for us. Yep, and this last shift is about selecting texts for beginning readers. And here we unpack four common misunderstandings, <clears throat> excuse me, about text selection for the most beginning readers, such as this one, which is misunderstanding number two in the chapter. And that is the assumption that predictable texts, patterned leveled texts make, read, make learning to read easier. And this honestly was one of the hardest shifts for us, but we unpack this misunderstanding along with three others by connecting back to the way the human brain learns to read. And the takeaway in a nutshell is that beginning readers need access to texts that are closely aligned to a phonic scope and sequence while still giving them something to think about. That thoughtful, gradual approach we're gonna take in the phonics classroom, the little books we put in front of kids should be additional opportunity to practice in a cumulative way and get really firm with those concepts. But as it turns out, there are some real issues with many of the little books that many of us have loved so much especially those at the very earliest levels. Mm -hmm. And this is why finding high quality decodable texts aligned to your phonic scope and sequence is so critical. Books that don't rely on heavy patterning or habituate those unhelpful word solving practices, but instead give lots of chances to practice learning the alphabetic code in reliable ways. Mm -hmm. while also giving children something to think about. And so in this chapter, we offer seven high leverage routines for locating and or even creating texts that give children opportunities to practice their growing phonics skills and to read for meaning. And if you're ready to do some thinking about texts, when you're ready to do some thinking about texts, we offer this evaluation tool that helps you examine beginning reading texts, thinking about the tensions within them. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that you don't have to throw out the texts you're currently using. You don't have to throw out all of your leveled texts, but you do need to come to an understanding of which type of text offers children the practice they need at the right time. And so the takeaway for shift six is that kids need texts that support them in doing the right kind of reading work at the right time. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. You've, you've got an overview of the whole book. Across the whole book and the whole class, we unpack 27 misunderstandings and we give you 37 high leverage routines. And so that was part one. And so now we're gonna move on to the last section of the presentation, which will give you ways to leverage the book for change. And we're gonna shift our attention to some things you might want to remember or some things you might try as you are working to make change in your own classroom or to lead change in your school and district. And this is 
These are ways that others have used um, these ideas and these materials to, to support more brain-friendly instruction in classrooms and make learning to read easier for children. Because we know that children like Jonathan and Lucia, who have, we've really been intentional about keeping them as a common thread throughout this presentation, they're why you are here tonight. Um, and so, but the only way to change student outcomes is for us to first change adult practices. And with that idea in mind, another thing that we have created is um, called Shifting the Balance Leadership Toolkit. And this toolkit is designed to help school leaders um, bring more science aligned and brain friendly instruction to all the children in your school through this sort of relentless commitment to keeping, uh, getting and keeping momentum going one action at a time, one teacher, one shift, one day at a time. And so we believe you can get the momentum started by committing to take stock in one or two or even all six areas, all six shifts. You might look at the six and think, wow, that was a lot. That's like everything from A to Z. But um, on the other hand, you might think, yeah, we want to take a look at all six of these. So the leadership toolkit provides you help to find the starting points that are just right for you in your setting. Um, it's set up with some um, self-ranking scales and some reflection tools that will help you to take stock of the current practices in your school or setting, reflect and prioritize on strengths and opportunities um, for next steps, and then to set momentum in action in ways that are clear, that help to bring the whole school along. And so if you're interested in grabbing that leadership toolkit, it's at a little different um, site than the rest. We don't have it up on our um, common download site yet. It's still kind of a, a draft thing. Um, so you can get it at the sixshifts.com backslash leadership tools. And um, I think let's move into the next six big ideas, Jan. Yeah, we do like the number six, don't we? So in this final section, we want to offer six big ideas for shifting the momentum wherever you are. And these six ideas represent a collection of what we've learned from educators across the country and even across the globe. And um, I was just reading comments in the chat box from our friend from South Africa. So that's really, that's really lovely to see. And so as we've seen shifts transform individual practices, schools, and districts. And so big idea number one is to remember that this is head work and heart work. And meaningful and sustainable change in classrooms can only happen when teachers are connected with reliable information delivered in a caring and respectful approach, especially during this time of fatigue and burnout. And this, you know, this respectful tone has been such a priority for us with this work. And we think it's why shifting the balance is finding its way into places where these ideas have been previously rejected. So it kind of, um, it helps teachers work past triggers or it, it prevents triggers from coming up in the first place. One kindergarten teacher said, my district has taken a strong stance on science of reading versus balanced literacy. So really fueling this, this tension and it's created a very contentious atmosphere. And your book has presented the science in a way that helped me as a 28 year veteran with a reading recovery background and years of Fountas and Pinnell training to see the argument in a way that wasn't combative for rethinking my current practices. I'm coming away with a mindset that I can do this. And here's another example of a school leader who, when the message was presented respectfully, was able to work past her triggers and move the teacher she leads forward. She said, the timing of the Shifting the Balance book in class was so perfect for me. I was feeling frustrated that people were saying, why aren't we teaching phonics anymore? Or balance literacy is fluff. So I appreciated that 
the when we know better, we do better mentality and to give ourselves grace knowing mistakes were made. And now that I see again what the science says, I'm recommitted to confidently support teachers um, to teach their students. So in our experience, the sweet spot for momentum has to do with not only honoring the science of learning to read, but also very intentionally honoring the science for supporting change, for leading change and, and how humans change, which has a lot to do with the six commandment, uh, six commandments, the six commitments. <laughs> boy, <laughs> that's a fun oh boy, one, right? Which has Johnny, a lot I'll to edit to that one out. <laughs> that's right. Which has a lot to do with the six commitments that we shared at the beginning of this presentation. Yeah. Well, the second big idea we want to offer for making a meaningful shift is to never, 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 never underestimate the power of one person deciding it's time for something to change. You showed up here tonight. That means you are a leader mm -hmm. and your actions can be what start the shift in your setting. You know, I'm just having this moment again, Jan, of thinking about Donna. Mm -hmm. If you want an example of never <laughs> underestimate the power of one person deciding to do something, maybe you've heard Donna's story. She had heard of a Facebook group. She didn't really know what it was when she started this thing, but she did something. She took a risk. And we really want to encourage that. Um, one person deciding to take a risk make a change, explore another option is how change begins. And the good news is that even though you might feel lonely, sometimes you're never truly alone on this journey because we live in this amazing connected digital age. So even if you are truly, you know, we had several um, number, I think it's number two on the list where you mm -hmm. feel like you're, you're the lone shadow person. water. Yeah. Um, but, you know, through the power of social networking, groups such as this one sponsoring this event tonight, online resources, webinars, you can always build that personal learning network and just find some people. You know, Jan and I, Minnesota and Georgia, we found each other because we were in a social networking group together. And now it's turned into this beautiful cross country you know, long-term friendship and um, writing partnership. And we really believe in the power of that. So your courage, you, plus the connection with others who are also on the journey will give you both the energy and the ideas to start making the change. Um, and sometimes that might be small. We want to share this. Um, this is from um, Holly, who is um, a, a tutor who took our class and she says, I've incorporated your approaches to teaching reading this summer with my tutoring students and the tutors who I train are working with kids, uh, working with kids report the same success. Holly's excited about just making a few simple changes to her practice, being the one to decided to, who decided to um, take, that, take that leap and then share it with others. <laughs> Donna. Donna saying we're like peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> we go together well. <laughs> I'm the sweet one. She's the sticky one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the third, the third thing we want you to really remember is that overwhelm, as we mentioned earlier, is real and momentum has to start somewhere. So idea number three is to simply commit to a starting point and get going. And we're big believers in the power of the domino effect. And just like you cannot underestimate the power of one person, you can't underestimate the power of one small action, that keystone habit that changes and begins a domino effect with everything. And so the one step you take might be to try one new high leverage routine like word chains or phoneme graphing mapping in your classroom, or it might be to recommend one resource to someone that you'd like to start a conversation with, or it might be, you know, speaking of conversations, it might be to initiate a conversation with your school principal or literacy coach or another decision maker. It might be to initiate a book study with even a few other educators or to consider being a scout 
in an online class or webinar to see if it might be something that would be helpful to others in your setting. Angie, and I really love Angie's story. Angie chose to begin with an instructional shift herself and the changes she made had very cl clear benefits for her students. She said, I began making some of the shifts with a first grader I was working with and saw tremendous growth in her reading ability and most importantly, her confidence. Her high frequency word recognition doubled in three weeks and I never explicitly taught her many of the words she learned, astounding. And Angie went on to, to be an influencer in her school. And also, um, you know, this is this idea that kids learn to be good mappers, which is something David Kilpatrick refers to. So idea four, idea four has to do with building a team. And although it is true that one person who then connects with another person who connects with another person can really get a ball rolling. It's also true that deep and meaningful change can only happen school-wide or system-wide with a diverse intentional literacy leadership team. A team of educators who come to the table with varied backgrounds and experiences, but with a common interest in making learning to read easier, not harder for children. And building a diverse literacy leadership team can be a really pivotal pivotal first step for any school or district. When building a team, we, we would really suggest that you consider ensuring your team has administrators, classroom teachers, special ed teachers, reading interventionists, SLPs. They are often overlooked, your speech language pathologists, but they have so much to bring to the conversation. And also make sure that, you know, if you have strong balanced literacy advocates and strong science of reading advocates in your setting, which you likely do, that both are represented on your leadership team because making progress depends on figuring out how to listen to each other and build bridges. Mm -hmm. Uh, we love this quote from Amy Poehler, find a group of people who challenge and inspire you, spend a lot of time with them, and it will change your life. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's a quote that we share from uh, Julia, and Julie says, I'm fortunate to have colleagues who have also participated in this course, and I'm excited to be able to discuss with them the changes we can make to our practice to benefit our students. I think this just really speaks to the power of shared experiences. And if you have a newly formed literacy leadership team, it's, in, it's, it's a really powerful way to start by thinking what are some shared learning experiences for us? Can we listen to, to a podcast series together? Can we read a, um, you know, a short, a short uh, post, an article, a book? Uh, the leadership team needs common learning experiences to get the conversation started. Mm -hmm. So idea number five really gets to the heart of long-term sustainable change to practice, not just in one classroom or grade level, but across a school or district. And this big idea is to plan for the whole school um, ongoing professional development and an investment in professional development for teachers is an investment in long term outcomes for children. And in schools where we see the most success, it's because the leadership team is committed to investing in high quality learning opportunities for all educators across time. It's not a one and done. Um, it's ongoing and sustained. And so looking at all possible options for ongoing learning including PLC times, faculty meetings, early dismissal days, professional learning days, and creating opportunities for staff members to learn together, engage in professional dialogue, and support each other in embedding science-aligned practices into their work with children. And most importantly, successful schools make sure that educators continue to learn from each other in really practical ways by sharing and celebrating successes as well as problem solving the sticky spots. Like Jacqueline, who is a literacy specialist in Maine, who recognized the power of 
um, reading science and the, the heart head approach um, to sharing it. She proclaimed, this will transform our school year. And this seems like a good place to mention some of the other resources that you'll find on our site. We have a seven part, uh, you know, these are uh, possible options as you're thinking about thoughtful approaches to professional learning at your school. We have a seven part podcast series that dips into each of the six shifts and is available wherever you get your podcast or on, on our YouTube channel, um, which is Jan and Carrie, one word. We had um, we had somebody in our online class who shared with us. It was a school leader who said she used the podcast series and they just did a walk and listen. Those podcasts are 10 minutes or less. And so it's a really easy way to, you know, move your body, do some listening and then come back together and have some meat to have some conversation about. Mm -hmm. um, and those are on our website, but you can also access that podcast series wherever you get your podcasts. Mm -hmm. And if you want um, to support a book study, which is, of course, another of our favorite options for school-wide learning, um, we have a free study guide on our site. Actually, all these resources, um, with the exception of the class and the book, are free resources that we've shared tonight. So, um, But there's a free study guide. There's a page dedicated to book studies. So it's a little bit different page than the download page. It's backslash book studies. But there are a lot of resources there, including the podcast. And some videos that that welcome people to the book study and really like there's there's a video that kind of highlights the, the six shifts and tries to give some mindset encouragement to people who are embarking on the work. Yeah. And so and if you want to go even deeper, um, the online class we've been referring to throughout this presentation has a new cohort starting on January 10th. Why are you smiling? Because I see we have a slide up that says November 1st. But. Oh, good. Well, it's January 10th. <laughs> we also offer um, customized cohorts of our online class for schools or districts with um, start and end dates that you get to select to match the adult learning. Um, We'll put a we'll put a link to some information about that into the chat box. Um, yeah, that really, we really we started to do that because we learned from school leaders who were reaching out to us to say, you know, I see you have an online class. I have a group of teachers I'd like to register, but your timeline isn't great for us. You know, six weeks isn't long enough for us to do this as a school or a group within the school. So what we've worked to, to make available to schools is that if you have a group, we have some options for spreading it out, like Jan said, on a timeline that really matches your available times. Mm -hmm. So, Carrie, Carrie, number six. Carrie, you get to do number six again. Yeah, we went back and forth about what number six could should be because there were a lot of good options. But we decided just keep going. <laughs> it, has it can feel sometimes like, are we making progress? Maybe you're feeling tired or you know um, discouraged at times. But we really say just keep going and just keep going, especially with your learning. Committing to keep learning, we think, is the most important thing that any of us can do, and it's really what you know. It's really what we try to be most committed to ourselves. So as you think about that little sweet spot Jan, Jan talked about earlier, um, that sweet spot for change between the science of learning to read and the science of leading for change, you might think, oh, I've really got to continue to stretch myself to learn more about the science of learning to read. There's so much to learn. There's so much to think about. But on the other hand, you might already know a lot about the science and yet still feel like you're not getting the traction that you had hoped for wherever you are in your setting. In which case, maybe your next opportunities are to think more about the science of change and how to tap into the hard work and moving people from fear or polarization to collaboration and forward momentum. And really, we should we should point out there are a number of books on this slide, but the one in the back, in the middle in the back, is really probably a first choice, Think Again by Adam Grant. Wow, do we love that book. Mm -hmm. um, the Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. Oh, boy. Uh, if, if you're trying to fill out a holiday wish list for anybody, put that one right at the top. It's a beauty. And so we leave you. 
with the idea that bridge building, the bridge building we believe so much in is really humble and complex work. It calls on us to stretch out across sometimes rough waters and to create this path of connection. Chan and I have been inspired by so many amazing bridge builders these past months, and they have helped us to see that bridge building is truly the way forward. Whether it's connecting research to practice or um, creating a connection across two polarized camps of pedagogy, bridge building is the critical key for momentum. So we encourage you, go ahead, take that next step. We're right here cheering for you as you go. And, and thank you. We wanna say thank you again to Donna. We hope that you'll, um, it's just, we're just so grateful for her willingness to, to connect with us and give us this opportunity. And here is how we're, we are the six shifts on every platform we're on. So it makes it easy to remember how to find us. And um, except for YouTube, we're Jan and Carrie there. That's right. Um, I blame and so her. what? I said, I blame you for that. Uh, it's probably my fault. So <laughs> I'm really good at taking feedback, you know. So I know you're good at I'm, taking feedback. So Donna, what are we going to do? Okay, are we ready? Is it, I mean, and we all could like do a little drum roll. We're going to give away three seats to our online class. Is that right? Yep. All Maybe right. You use like a magic machine back there and you know just the right three names. I use math. And I hate <laughs> math. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I put everybody a list and I did math and division and that this is what I came up with. Okay, All our right. first winner is Michelle Hammond or Hammonds. Michelle, yeah. are you here? Yay. If you're here Yay, and you Michelle. want it, let us know. And Barbara Zimmer or Zimmerman, I didn't write the whole name down. I saw Barbara earlier. She was, I think she's the one who spoke, who, who turned on her mic and spoke. Barbara's oh. here. Hey, yeah. Barbara, Michelle, we're here. We're excited to have you in our class. Yeah. And oh, Lorna cool. Douglas. Lorna oh, Douglas. Lorna here? I'm here. Yay. <laughs> it's always fun to win something, isn't it? <laughs> fun. <laughs> Great. And so um, we do have a class beginning January 10th. And for those of you who won, um, we hope you'll join us January 10th. But we also recognize that winning tonight and January 10th is right around the corner. If that doesn't work for you, we'll work with you to get you in another session as well. And um, we thank you so much. Yeah. yeah, we just thank everybody. And we just salute educators. I mean, here we are. I know I'm confused about time zones tonight, but whatever time it is, it's it's getting past. Uh, I mean, right? It's evening. It's, it's like yeah. winter time. I yeah. know. In South Africa, I'm not sure if it's dinner time, but it might be. Very. We just morning. celebrate you all for showing up. Stephanie, Stephanie has her hand raised. Hi. Um, yeah, my team, I'm an instructional specialist um, in Cypher in uh, Cypress, Texas. And my little team that was trying to join, we could not get the Zoom. It didn't show up in our email until 6.50. Oh no. So we missed okay. all of it. And so we're very sad. <laughs> How do we get a recording of this link? Okay. So I will be uploading it as soon as we're done and it'll be on Donna Heitmanic YouTube. And I will also okay. put it um, in a post. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. You're Thanks, so Stephanie. Welcome. Stephanie, we're sorry that you and your team didn't get in sooner, um, but um, does that mean you gathered tonight? Well, we I have everybody's at home, but we have a little, yeah. we have a um, kind of a committee because we're, yeah. we're shifting from, yeah. you know, balanced literacy. We, we do balanced literacy in our district. And of course we're going to the science of reading. And so we've been uh, meeting. And so my little, my committee was all ready to join and it didn't work out. And so I want to make sure that they get to see this and I want to see it so we can yeah. move forward yeah. in our work. Well, 
yeah, luckily Donna did record it and she is planning to put it up on YouTube. So, um, yep, we're It'll sorry be, about that. It, That's it okay, no up worries, tonight. I'm glad it's recorded. So, yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, great. All right. All right, and we have one Thank more. Thank you so Stephanie. much, friends. Stephanie, What'd you say, Donna? We have one more hand up, Stephanie Spain. Oh, okay. That was Stephanie. No, that was the one we just did. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm not paying attention to names. It's good. Okay, everyone, Go um, keep spreading the word about the Science of Reading Facebook page. Let everybody know about us. And, um, and of course, this fabulous book that uh, is changing lives around the world. Love you guys. Thank Bye. You. Thanks for showing up, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Donna. Bye, everyone. You guys are the best. It's me. Here. All Excuse of me. You. Yes. <laughs> Someone so talking. Yes, it's Lorna. Hi, Lorna. I'm so excited to do this course. Thank you. Sure. Oh, we're so excited you're excited to do the course. I'm doing a principal, my principal's qualifications right now. And um, oh. I've done, I'm doing my practicum on uh, shifting using science of reading. And I'm about to start a book talk in a couple of weeks with this group, with um, a, a good group at my school of, of different grades and different positions. And so this is, this is incredible. So oh, thank great. you. So I well, would encourage everyone here that's still here is do that. Get a book study going in your, in your school. Um, even if it's three people or just your team, just, just do it. And you'll be able to affect some change. Mm -hmm. I, I just know it. So good yeah, luck we, everyone. We, yeah. So how are we going to access the course if we want it? There, there yeah, also was a question, Carrie and Jan, about um, is there a limit on the number of people who can be in the, the new cohort? I, I responded, there is, a, there is a limit to the group size, but there's plenty of room. So, um, okay. and if you're talking about signing up a large group, you probably would want a custom class anyway. So um, there, yeah, there's room. There's room right now. We haven't really started advertising it in earnest yet. So um it the the registration though is live on our site so and the people who won donna's going to share your email with us and then somebody actually um you don't have it do you i'm i will if they could put, if you're still on put it in the chat um otherwise i'll have to dig for it you could direct <laughs> message maybe donna with it or we can i mean we can tell you our email too Mm -hmm. Should we just, oh. you, you could just send it's it. It's actually on the, it, it was, I can reshare the screen. It's a okay. list. Just Jan and Carrie at the six shifts.com. Okay. There's mm -hmm. Lorna. And I'm also downloading this chat so we can mm -hmm. get hold of that. Okay. And Donna, the, the woman's name was Barbara Zimmer, not Zimmerman. It was Barbara Zimmer. Zimmer. Okay. Barbara Zimmer. Thank you. Oh, here we go. Jan and Carrie, oh, would you mind sharing the screen and sharing the slide it. one of the six shifts? That oh, you yes. I'm put. sorry. I saw no, that you asked for that. And then I forgot to go back. I didn't want to do it in the middle of when Carrie was talking because. Yes. Well, oh, I, absolutely. Obvious reasons. So let me, um, let me just go back. And I think I, think I zoned out for a while. And, that that is like, just... and then I looked and I was, wait, 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 there was good. And I missed number one. <laughs> Can you see it? It's funny because my slides are not changing. We're kind of stuck on the let's stay in touch, but are we talking about um, of the six big ideas? Is that? Yes. What? And yes. I'm, I'm changing the slides, but they're not changing. It's like okay. my technology well, I'm is. I'm going to tell you what it is. How about that? It's don't forget this is head work and heart work. Mm. And that really... Um, you know, that's just a really important tenant that we've discovered. Um, you can push hard and get stuck if you forget about the hard work side of things, especially during a global pandemic. Mm -hmm. There it is. Care of each other. There it is. All right. Okay, everyone. Are we good? Okay. We're yeah. good. Okay, we take care. We'll talk soon. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.